Again, my name is Tristan Gould, and I'm a remote sensing scientist in the AOP group, and I'm going to give a talk this morning on um, discrete LiDAR uncertainty. So generally, um, here we talk about two major sources of uncertainty, um, geolocation uncertainty as well as uh, processing uncertainty. So geolocation uncertainty deals with um, the uncertainty that's associated with each of the instrumented subsystems within the LIDAR. So, um, you know, the GPS and IMU, laser ranger, laser scanner, um, and the measurements that they make and how the error in those, each of those measurements combines into um, geolocation error for the actual um, point cloud. So, generally in that situation, horizontal uncertainty for LIDAR is greater than vertical uncertainty. Um, what we've seen is that if you look at the instrument specifications for LIDAR, they generally don't give you a very good impression of what the uncertainty is. So generally, they give you uncertainty specifications in very optimistic conditions um, that you're not going to see for the most part in the real world. And so vegetation and terrain conditions will also affect the uncertainty uh, in the point cloud. But then we also have processing uncertainty, um, which is really one of the larger sources of error that we have, uh, and it's much more difficult to quantify than the geolocation error, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So I just wanted to go through um, sort of the different processing steps and how the uncertainty is introduced into the, the LiDAR system in each one of those steps. So the first is the airborne trajectory, which we talked about yesterday. And so you can see here we've got a picture of this airborne trajectory, and it's colored by um, an uncertainty that was given, a predicted uncertainty that was given by the commercial software that we used to uh, produce the trajectory. So the red areas are high uncertainty, yellow sort of middle, and then the blue areas are a little bit better. So the uncertainty in the trajectory is a combination of the distance you are from your GPS base station, the distribution and number of satellites, the lever arms inside of the um, system. And those are the linear distances from the GPS antenna down to the IMU and from the IMU to the laser sensor. So we have to measure those linear distances between those so that we can, when we get the position at the GPS, we can translate that down to the laser and then down to the ground. So those need to be measured. And of course, the accuracy of the IMU. Now, what we found, um, some really nice stats that Bridget worked up um, this past year, is that when you look at the simulated uncertainty from the um, software, what it tells us is that the distance from the base station is actually the most important factor when we're looking at the uncertainty in the trajectory. And this is sort of an average of the predicted uncertainty for all our flights across the entire season and the distance from the base station. And you can see at around 20 kilometers, you get this jump, and that starts increasing. So this is one of the reasons we try to keep our base stations always within 20 kilometers of the flight, because we know that after that, the uncertainty starts to really raise in that trajectory. And the trajectory is really the base of our, um, all of our geolocation, so it's really important that we maintain um, really accurate trajectory. So we also get um, these stats at the end of the flight that tell us what the uncertainty in the easting, northing, and elevation are um, for the flight. So to further um, look at this idea of the uh, distance of the base station, we had some flights in D, um, I think that's D8, uh, three different sites. And what we did is we had base stations located at the site. And we processed the trajectory with the base station and without the base station. And then we compared the difference between those trajectories at the sites. And so in some cases, um, this didn't turn out very well. In fact, we got upwards of over half a meter difference in those trajectories when we weren't using the base station. So this is, a, this is a huge deal for us. We're trying to meet 15 centimeters of accuracy in the LIDAR. So if we're getting these types of errors on the trajectory, we're completely gone. Um, but a lot of times, I mean, I think in this particular trajectory, this area of high uncertainty was when we were transiting and, and far from other base stations. And so you can get situations like that. Um, another site we looked at, it's, it was a little bit better, 
wasn't quite as bad. It was more than 15, about 15 centimeters of difference between those two, but still a big deal to us. So, I mean, it's obvious that having that base station really close um, to the trajectory is really important to maintain the, the error that we want. PDOP is a measure of, um, like it's a descriptor of uncertainty in the GPS satellite constellation. So that's, that's one of the um, portions that contributes or gives you an idea of what the uncertainty in the trajectory is gonna be. If you have a high PDOP, then you're gonna have a high uncertainty in the trajectory. But um, what we found is that that distance from the base station, making sure that that's low is way more important than making sure the PDOP is low. As generally, since we're doing flights just in the United States, the GPS satellite constellation is dense most of the times around here, and so we usually get enough satellites and a good distribution, so the PDOP is generally low. So after the trajectory, we have the uh, LMS processing. So this is the processing that we do um, in, in the commercial software that's provided by Optech. And so a couple things. At the beginning of the season, uh, we do a flight um, to measure the bore sites. And so the bore sites are angular differences between how the LIDAR sits and how the IMU sits. So basically, the IMU is giving us our orientation in the sky. Um, and then the LIDAR head, we need to know the relationship between how that's sitting to with the IMU to properly geolocate all the observations on the ground. And the small angular differences, these are usually sub-degree differences between the um, IMU and the, the laser head are called boresight misalignments. And we do a dedicated flight over Greeley each year to measure what those boresight misalignments are. Of course, those are calculated, and so there's always potentially a little bit of uncertainty. And so um, after we do a flight, what we can do is we can look at how the data in the overlapping strips um, matches. So like I mentioned before, we have 30% overlap in each one of those strips. So what we can do is we can look to see how well that overlap data matches and how well it compares with each other. If it compares really well, um, we get these vertical differences associated with scan angle, and the software plots these. And so th if this is a nice flat line, that tells us that the system is in a really good alignment. But it's also possible to get situations like this where we kind of get this angled um, distribution here where there's some bias with scan angle. So if that happens, it tells us that the boresight alignments need to be redone or, um, or checked again. And then often if we see this, then we'll do mid-season boresight alignments to get these uh, graphs to go back flat. So there's also what's called intensity table corrections, and these are factory calibrations that are provided by Optech. And basically these are range adjustments that are applied to the range based on um, the PRF and the returned intensity. Um, so we really have no control over these. It's, it's um, corrections that are done in the lab uh, back at Optech. So after we fly the trajectory, we get our boresight misalignments, we process this data through, through the Optech software. What we're then able to do is check the vertical accuracy of the LIDAR, and we do that over a runway here in Boulder. So a couple years ago, we went out and took uh, about two to 300 really high accuracy GPS points across the entire runway. And so errors of about one, one centimeter or so. So then what we do is we use all of those GPS points and interpolate between them to get sort of a validation surface of the entire runway. So we know what the elevation is everywhere on the runway. And then when we fly over it, these are all the LIDAR points that land on the runway. And then we can get the vertical difference between each of those LIDAR points and that validation surface. And so when we do that, since the LIDAR is collecting hundreds of thousands of points per second, we get this really great distribution um, with a really high sample that gives us an uh, impression of what the error is. And so since we try to fly over the um, runway with the laser at nadir, so the plane is directly above the runway, the primary error sources that are gonna be contributing to these statistics are the errors in the laser ranger and um, the errors, the vertical error in the GPS. Um, other types of errors like in the IMU or in the scan angle, they're gonna only propagate more heavily into 
large scan angles, not so much at nadir. So usually these stats are just giving us an idea of how well the laser ranger and the GPS is operating. So these are some results for um, several different lines that we did over the runway. You can see that we've separated them by PRF. And so that's the pulse repetition frequency, how fast the laser is pulsing. And as I mentioned yesterday, we only fly at 100 kilohertz or less, and this chart shows why. So that when we get to 100 kilohertz, you can see that we have very low mean and standard deviations at some of these higher PRFs, 125, 142. The errors are above our limits of 15 centimeters. So this is why we fly only at 100 kilohertz and below. So we also want to test the horizontal accuracy of the LiDAR system in addition to the vertical. And the main source of error in the horizontal component of um, the LiDAR points is due to the beam divergence of the laser pulse. And so think about a laser, you think it's coming out and it's very thin, tight, um, you know, bound of energy as it's coming out. But the uh, instantaneous field of view on the laser, or the beam divergence, is 0.8 milliradians. So that means when we're flying at 1,000 meters, when that laser pulse hits the ground, its diameter is 80 centimeters. And so what can happen is that the energy distribution of that pulse is actually Gaussian shaped. And so most of the energy is contained in the center, but out towards the edge at this uh, 1 over E level, this is our 80 centimeter diameter here. So you can see there's still lots of energy out further than that, and it only takes about 1 to 2 percent of the energy to get returned back to the LiDAR system to trigger a uh, return pulse. And so what can happen when you have this really wide beam is that, say, if we were flying over here and we were going to the table, which is a very uh, hard, flat surface, if our beam came down here and it's 80 centimeters, it can come down and the edge of the beam can hit the table. That return is going to go back from the edge of the table, but the coordinate gets associated with the center of the beam. So then it looks like the table is over here because the center of the beam was over here and the edge of it hit the table. And so since the coordinate's associated with here, but we got the elevation from the edge of the table, then it actually ends up over here. And so um, what we can do is we can, what we do is actually fly um, several flights over the headquarter buildings. And we went out and we um, used like traditional surveying a total station to survey all the corners of the headquarter buildings. And then we fly over these. And then we look as the pulses, as we're scanning across and the pulses are coming up to the building edge, where do they first jump from the ground up to the building edge? And what we find is that it's usually some distance away from the building edge where we see that first jump up. And then we can uh, calculate this perpendicular distance, and that gives us an impression of what the horizontal error is going to be. And so when we do that, we see that it's about um, pretty close to half of our uh, beam divergence, which is uh, 40 centimeters. So we have that 80 centimeter full diameter, but then as we're coming up, we're only 40 centimeters away from the building edge when we see that jump. So that shows us that the primary source of error in this horizontal um, component is the, the beam divergence. There's going to be some GPS error, some other types of error, but they're pretty much dwarfed by this beam divergence error. So then when we can, we also try to validate um, our digital train models when we're going out to sites. And so we visit a couple sites per year um, to do some ASD measurements just to support the spectrometer. But when we do that, we also collect um, LiDAR validation points using rapid static GPS techniques. So basically, we take a high accuracy GPS, set it out for about 20 minutes, collect observations, get elevations sort of throughout the site. And then we take each one of those elevations and we compare it to the elevation we get from the digital terrain model. So this is an example of doing that at Oak Ridge. And these, all these circles show the different uh, GPS points that we collected. And then we, this uh, chart down here shows that vertical difference between the GPS points and the DTM. So you can see that we're doing pretty good. We got a mean of about four centimeters and a standard deviation of about six centimeters. So this is pretty consistent with what you can expect for most commercial uh, LiDAR providers. 
So then to give people an idea of what uh, those errors are uh, kind of across the entire site that are associated with the instrument, what we do is we actually simulate uh, the error in every single point that the LiDAR has acquired based on errors that we uh, know for the um, GPS and IMU, laser ranger and laser scanner. So uh, we propagate the errors through each one of those instrument components into every single point. And then we get horizontal and vertical errors for every single point and then uh, we create LAZ files or LAS files where we take out the elevation but insert the vertical uncertainty. So then you can plot these LAZ files and instead of having the elevation, they have the, the vertical uncertainty in, instead. Um, we use the algorithm that I published in 2010, so if anyone wants to know more about that, then feel free to ask. Generally what you find is that um, you can see here that sort of at the edges of line, these are all different lines that we've flown at the edges of lines, the uh, uncertainty is a little bit higher. And that's because um, at nadir, uh, you don't have a lot of the errors uh, propagating in from the scan angle. So as you scan higher, any errors, say in beam divergence or errors in the scan angle, errors in roll pitch and law, they'll propagate higher into the vertical coordinate as you get a larger scan angle. So generally what we see is that the edges of scans have higher uncertainty than the center. It's also good potentially if you can fly um, where your edge, you're flying with 50% overlap, where your edge is hitting the center of the adjacent line because then you're getting your highest error compared to your lowest error. But it's always a trade-off between flying time and things like that. I think I mentioned yesterday, you know, we use the triangular regular network to create our DTMs, and then from those DTMs, we create our slope and aspect. And so I mentioned that one of the downfalls of the TIN interpolation method is that we don't get um, any filtering um, due to redundancy within each individual grid cell. And so we create the DTM just natively with the TIN interpolation routine, but then as we create the slope and aspect, I run a three by three moving average across the DTM before calculating the slope and aspect. And this slide kind of demonstrates why we do that. Um, you can see over here, this is just the raw DTM over uh, the runway. And if you look at the slope, you can see it's like really variable across the runway. The runway is a really flat surface. It doesn't have slopes that are ranging from zero to five degrees. And the reason we see that is because there's a lot of noise in the LiDAR points. So you're just getting your slope between those really noisy points. And so then if we run a three by three moving average, across um, the DTM and then calculate the slope, you get this blue line here. So you can see the slope is a lot less over the runway after we do that. So next, um, I wanna talk about the canopy height model uncertainty. This is a analysis I did at the San Joaquin Experimental Range. So I was able to get field measured tree heights for a lot of the trees throughout the site and then compare those directly to grid cells in the canopy height model. And after getting rid of some uh, outliers and some other points that they measured, for example, sometimes you'll get points that they measure on trees that are lower than the upper canopy, and the LiDAR is only seeing the top of the canopy, so you need to get rid of those. Um, I got this regression line. So we should get a one-to-one -one regression, and this is pretty close. It's actually not statistically different from one. Um, no trend in the residuals, but the important part here is that um, the intercept value is negative 0 0.493. It means that generally we're underestimating the tree height with the LIDAR. This is a fairly common problem that you'll see in the literature that tree heights are generally underestimated by LIDAR. And this is because the pulse actually penetrates partially into the tree crown before enough energy is um, returned to, to trigger that return pulse. So you'll get some infiltration down and then you'll get that return, enough energy to go back and, and get a return pulse. And so us seeing sort of about half meter below these trees is pretty consistent which, with what most people have seen in the literature. So something that we've also done, um, some more uh, in-depth analysis of the CH of the canopy height model uncertainty. 
Um, and we leveraged uh, BRDF flights that we flew primarily for the spectrometer. These flights are designed so that we can see um, how the spectrometer is going to give different observations using different um, flight tracks, angles, and orientations of the flight tracks. So the nice thing about these flights is we're actually able to leverage the center portion of this where we get 20 lines overlapping. So I can actually make 20 canopy height models. And then in this overlapping portion, just look at every cell and see how it varies between all of those different canopy height models in that um, center portion. So it enables us to sort of empirically derive what the precision in the canopy height model um, is. I did this analysis on, on canopy height models. Amanda is actually continuing this analysis this summer and applying the same algorithm to all of our other data products in addition to the canopy height model. And that's what she'll talk about uh, this afternoon. So these are just some images that's showing, you know, when we overlap all those um, flight lines, you get this nice area in the center where we have all the flight lines overlapping, 18 in one, 20 in the other. So we're able to um, create all those different um, rasters. There's an example. And then we can look at the center portion and actually get these rasters of uncertainty, where each cell represents the standard deviation of the canopy height model um, across all those different lines. So I guess the kind of the take home message from this is that this is the average uncertainty that we saw in the canopy height model at each one of these sites. So at San Joaquin, 1.9 meters, at Soap Root, 2.2 meters, and Oak Ridge, 1.1 meters. Um, I have sort of a more in-depth presentation on this stuff, which I'd be happy to give people. But the, the basic take home idea here was that each one of these sites represented really different forest types. And there's different factors at each forest type that contribute to the overall uncertainty. But also what this tells us is generally, if you're looking at an individual cell in a canopy height model, you could be looking at one to two meters of error at that actual cell. Yeah, so SJR is uh, like a savanna type uh, landscape with uh, shorter blue oak trees. And each oak tree is kind of individual, has some space around it. And sort of what we saw at San Joaquin was that due to that beam divergence issue that I mentioned before, the edges of the individual trees at San Joaquin had a lot of uncertainty because you had some points that would hit the edge of the tree and some points that would hit the ground. And so you got a lot of variation at the edges of those trees. At Soap Root, you had really tall, thin ponderosa pines. And so what happened is that as we flew those different orientations of the flight lines, sometimes the LIDAR point would hit mid-tree on those really tall, thin trees, and sometimes it would hit the top. And so on these really tall, thin trees, you'd get really high standard deviations, sometimes like 18 to 20 meters, just based on where the LIDAR point happened to hit the tree. Uh, and then at Oak Ridge, where we have a really heavy canopy, what happened was we got these areas here of high uncertainty, kind of these um, segments of high uncertainty throughout the canopy height model. And when you look into that, what you find is that at these areas, we also had really poor ground penetration underneath those heavy canopies. And so what happens is that there was a lot of interpolation that was occurring across the ground surface here. And in the different flight lines, this interpolation resulted in really different ground surfaces. And then when we're subtracting the top of the canopy down to the bottom, that resulted in really different um, canopy height estimations. So this problem that I mentioned at Oak Ridge is really important because it's a commonplace across a lot of our sites that we don't get good ground penetration. So this is an example of the Great Smoky Mountains flight that we flew <coughs> in 2015. And what it's actually colored by is the longest edge in any one of the tin triangles across the entire site. And so what we see is that generally these range between 0 to 3, 3 at the most. And this is for all the points. And so you know, at the most, we're interpolating 3 meters across any given area. We can look at that distribution. See, at the most, it was 3. But generally, it was below 1.5. This is because, like I told you guys, we're getting generally between 2 and 4 pulses per meter. And so generally, we don't have to interpolate much more than 0.5. 
1.5 meters. But this is what happens when we look at that same plot using the ground only points. See, using the ground only points, we're going from zero to 25 meters. And so there's particular areas in this really heavy canopy where we're interpolating the ground surface across 25 meters. And so that's gonna add a lot of uncertainty into the canopy height model because then if we miss a dip or a hill in the ground surface, it's really gonna affect um, the canopy height. So this is that same distribution except for the ground points only. See, we've got this little bump sort of um, aligned with the previous histogram. That's the open areas, but then this larger histogram showing underneath the canopy. And I will say that Great Smoky Mountains is probably one of the worst sites that we fly for this. So it is a worst case example. So something else that we've done and you will do directly after this is look at differences uh, at Pringle Creek. This is a really nice site to analyze the uncertainty because um, last year we flew the whole site in bad weather conditions just to get LIDAR coverage because we didn't think that the weather was going to improve. And then lo and behold, the next day the weather improved. So the very next day we flew it again to get good weather spectrometer data. So we have two LIDAR collections two days apart, or one day apart. So this, we can assume that nothing has changed in the site from day to day, and so that we can look at, okay, well, what, how it, did this acquisitions change between these two days? So that's the lesson we're gonna look at directly after this. So then there's also some larger processing uncertainty errors that mostly have to do with misclassification of the point cloud. So I mentioned yesterday about how we classify the point cloud into ground points, vegetation points, um, uh, and buildings, and unclassified. So this is a good example from um, the Flatirons, just local to here, where originally when we did our ground classification, it thought because those Flatirons were so steep, there's no way that the ground can go up that fast and that steep. So it assumed that these were not ground points on top of the flat irons, and so it actually cut all of the top of the flat irons off because it assumed that that was vegetation. And so there was actually um, talked with Martin who created last tools that did the classification on this. He actually made an improvement to um, the algorithm that um, allowed us to correct for that error. So you can see this is the original profile across the flat irons where we were cutting off a lot of those tops. And then this was uh, an improvement that was made to the algorithm that allowed us to, to do that. Unfortunately, this improvement works well in these cases but doesn't work as well in some other cases. And so I still generally use the old way to do this. Um, and I just got an email three weeks ago from the park service at Great Smoky Mountains and said, hey, you cut off a whole bunch of the top of the mountains in Great Smoky Mountains. So then I reprocessed it with the, the new method to, to correct that for them. So this can also happen um, with vegetation. So you can see up here, this is an RGB image of an area at Dead Lake, which is one of our D8, D8 sites. And in this area here, there's a lot of really low vegetation to the ground, right? There's actually one taller tree right here. You can see its shadow. And when we look at the canopy height model, all we see is this one tree. Everything else here is zero. So when the algorithm went through, it classified all this short vegetation as ground points, okay? And then when we look at the digital terrain model, those are included in the digital terrain model. And then you can see them here uh, in the hillshade. So actually, this misclassification of the vegetation points has added a lot of error into the digital train model. We look at a profile that goes across the digital train model there. I'm assuming the ground probably doesn't look like this. And that basically what we've gotten is a lot of that different vegetation that was incorrectly classified as ground points. So this can occur um, within our data it's more likely to occur on short vegetation. I think Keith's presentation yesterday, uh, he mentioned about the range resolution of the laser pulses in his waveform presentation. So the, the um, 
outgoing width of the Optech system is outgoing pulse width is 10 nanoseconds. And so based on that, we're only able to get a two meter range resolution. So we can't distinguish between two objects that are less than two meters to get apart. So when we get short vegetation that's lower than two meters, we're not gonna get the ground point beneath that vegetation. And so then what happens is that the algorithm sees this as the last point and it assumes that it must be the ground point. And then we get situations like this. So beware of short vegetation um, because it can definitely affect the digital terrain models. So, I mean, obviously we would like to correct these things, but you know, we're a small group here at NEON. Um, we're collecting a lot of data. So we rely on our classification algorithms to get us 85, 90% of the way there. Usually commercial providers will then have employees that get them the last 10% that takes 90% of the time. We're getting 90% of the way there and then we're delivering the data. So um, I just say if you're using Neon data, it's good to be aware that the classifications are getting you almost there but not completely. Good. Yeah, so I mean, this, all this classification is done from the LAS files which are available as the L1 product. And so, I mean, we give those last files by flight line with no classifications. And so you can re definitely reclassify the points. The other thing is right now we use this, the classification routine takes in several parameters. We use a standard set of parameters for all the sites. And probably it would be best to tweak those parameters slightly um, for each individual site. If we're ever gonna do that, we're gonna need to figure out a dynamic way to calculate what those parameters are as opposed to going in and changing them every time because our process is so automated at this point. And there is, I have seen research on this starting to come out of figuring out how to dynamically calculate um, the parameters for the classification. So hopefully that's gonna happen and then we'll be able to apply something that, that does a little bit better. And so um, the Regal system that we're gonna start flying uh, the end of this year, next year. It's outgoing pulse width is three nanoseconds as opposed to 10 nanoseconds. So that brings the range resolution of that system down to 60 centimeters as opposed to two meters. So then our take home messages um, for our uncertainty is that, you know, we try to get those base stations at less than 20 kilometers to make sure our trajectory um, is a high fidelity. We biannually test that sensor basically when it's going out and when it comes back at the runways for the, um, to test the vertical accuracy and then here at headquarters for the horizontal accuracy. Um, and then we're, ma we're monitoring that boresight, those boresight misalignments throughout the season. Um, the simulated air in the point clouds are available but remember these are based only on the um, errors in the individual sensor components. So those errors have nothing to do with any sort of classification error um, that may be introduced into the point cloud because that's something that's really difficult to quantify. So these errors really only tell you how well the sensor was operating, not how it interacted um, with the land cover. Um, the ground point density and heavy canopy um, can be sparse, which can lead to errors in the, the DTM and the CHM. And also these misclassifications are probably our largest source of error right now, so just to be aware for those. Yeah, so what we do is we actually um, relate everything back to the IMU. And so the IMU is like our base orientation um, system inside the plane. And so, you know, when the IMU is, you know, tipping back and forth and then the laser scanner is scanning out, we need to know what that difference is so that when we apply the roll and pitch and yawn things that, you know, it's being applied correctly. But then the NIST sensor is also sitting slightly differently. So we relate that back to the IMU as well. So since we have both related to the IMU, then we have that really high geolocation, relative geolocation between the two instruments.